My brizzles. What's the dizzle? This is Archangel, kicking it old school. One especially regrettable casualty of gynocentrism is male camaraderie, male companionship. You see, males can forge tight bonds if left unadulterated by female influence. It has been observed that males can be more free, more at ease. They laugh more and have more fun in the absence of female influence. They can be themselves rather than showboat and compete, which they do when hijacked by primal procreative and survival mandates. Nearly all treachery one male commits against another involves a female somewhere, somehow. Whether males squabble over specific females, or whether they quarrel and compete over social position or resource, with the end goal of attracting a female with the provision to sustain her. Males are capable, indeed wired, for intense loyalty and friendship in the absence of lower drives, such as sexuality ignited by shiny, colorful female influence. Males, especially those who experience adversity together, such as soldiers, they can forge bonds stronger than can be understood by outliers. Thus, many females take satisfaction in breaking males and usurping his relations to others, because relation relinquishment demonstrates his deferral to her, and this confirms her superior position of power. All of which flatters feminine ego. This dynamic is why romantic relations are merely a power struggle to establish control. Romantic relationships are nothing more honorable than ego stroking. Anyhow, males are capable of intense dislike escalating to conflict, followed by hostility cessation and or conflict resolution, finally concluding with respect, even fondness. This cycle is really an amazing male phenomenon. One guy was expressing this to me the other day, that males can fight with one another and be great friends afterwards. This communicates a deeper mechanism. Males' default setting is bonding with one another, and most will do so in the absence of duress, after survival or competition compulsions have abated. Meaning, they fight over chicks or they compete for alpha hierarchy. But when these pressures are spent, when primitive urges have subsided, guys can find themselves laughing and buying each other drinks. It would seem that males' natural state is to bond with other males, and the only time they act counter to this bonding default is when lower instincts pester them incessantly. Survival, reproduction, competition, etc. Lower motivators also include ego failings, such as insecurity, jealousy, envy, and so on. The seven deadly sins are a religious teaching tool to help humankind recognize and rectify primal behavior automacity in favor of more advantageous levels of communal interaction. And when guys entertain violence and meet a mutual respect afterwards, this supports male bonding default suppositions. Males are friendly when they are not under chemical or primal duress. Hmm. So the question becomes: Is male bonding a chemical driver, like oxytocin obliging males to females in intimate relations, or is there a higher affinity taking place? Perhaps there is some sort of bonding or euphoric agent released when males grapple, possibly something akin to oxytocin, which creates a degree of fondness or respect in the midst of conflict released in males' physiology that emotionally ingratiates them to their opponent. Or is male camaraderie our natural state, which is continually disrupted by reptilian motivations, which are so oppressing and ubiquitous it makes antagonism seem like males' natural state? There is definitely a bonding machination occurring in males who share combat, whether against one another or soldiers opposing a mutual foe. The bond of brothers in arms runs deep and will remain strong unless betrayal sullies that bond in the form of females or money. So there actually is balance. For just as males have the competition paradigm thrust upon them, which inspires separation and has them pitted against each other, there is also an infrastructure in place for male bonding, which compels camaraderie, cohesivity. Male antagonism and male bonding, both behavior modulators, can be likened to wolves vying for control over you, and the one who wins is the one that you feed the most.
and males feed the competition wolf, which is gynocentrism, when they involve themselves in female exaltation, which is characterized by deference to females, absolute protection of females, holding females to lesser standards than fellow males, and general sexual zealotry, guys beside themselves drooling over shiny painted up scantily clad females or female images. Guys that act the fool over any type of sexual innuendo that females use to manipulate feminine worshipping fiends. All this is feeding female exaltation through males' carnality weakness. However, when males excuse themselves from feminine exaltation, they attain the sobriety necessary to observe reality. And when sober males see the pain of fellow brothers, or they engage with other males without female exaltation crushing them with duress, then they feed the camaraderie and bonding wolf. When males meet each other on a human level, they find common ground and even fondness independent of treachery. Yet, if you have a shiny painted-up female enter the picture, or you adopt the company of a guy who has a vagina addiction, then you cannot have genuine interactions, for one party is looking to betray the other in order to sate primal drives, and thus in a world of males driven by basal desires, triggered by female presence, male antagonism and competition is the norm. Yet, if females and the sexual affection longings they incite are removed from male interactive scenarios, then males can and do genuinely bond. So, what is this telling us? Is it really females that ruin male camaraderie? In some cases, yes. Females purposefully nag, cajole, and manipulate male associations. Indeed, there are many females that enjoy having guys fight over her. This is the epitome of female influence, having males pitted against a fellow brainwashed, instinct-driven zombie trained to injure others over female approval. In essence, it's sexual titillation parlayed into violence for her benefit or entertainment. This is the gynocentric human male, and attractive females know the sway they hold over males. We see this all the time. When a guy gets a new girlfriend and she doesn't like his friends or family, he starts to estrange them at her behest. Females are totally guilty of their premeditated, even malevolent role in male degradation and abuse. Yet really, if guys are laughing at a bar and a pretty chick walks in, is it her fault they start posturing and cock-blocking the guys they were just laughing with? No, there is something deeper going on here. It is not so much females. Rather, it is men against their own biology. Females are simply the bait, but at the end of the day, it is males against themselves. You are staring down your very programming. Essentially, the duality of humanity is opposing wolves fighting inside you, and it would appear to boil down to camaraderie against reproduction. Because reproduction drives biological desire and incites heightened response to physical cues or pheromone sense. The primal reproductive urge is what takes over male senses and hijacks their logic centers around females. It is reproduction that relies on the secretion of chemical highs and intoxicants compelling males to seek out, chase, and compete for females. Reproduction is gynocentric, and reproductive imperatives are to blame for most all ill male behaviors. Reproduction compels male slavery, and all the romantic and emotional paradigms and interactions between the sexes are driven by reproductive imperatives through chemical reward and feel-good bonding agents. And since males actually produce the seed of humanity, it is crucial to drive males to ejaculate inside females for species continuity. And so males turning into unrecognizable, treacherous, backstabbing, masochistic zombies around pretty skirts, this is all essentially driven by reproduction. And if this primal drive was weaker than the desire for camaraderie, then humanity would not be here in the numbers that they are. So you can blame women for their intrusion into male associations, but really the blame lies with males, just as responsibility for male disposability. The true disruptor of male companionship is reproductive drives, usually manifest by males' inability to control their carnal appetites. Translated, sex is the saboteur of males. Sex is males' kryptonite. 
Sex means anything sexual, including the desire to look at pretty chicks, or kiss them, or touch them, the desire to impress non-familial females. All this is male sexual desire playing out in their ridiculous, foolish, peacocking, and backstabbing behaviors. It is males who do not control their sexual proclivities. This is the enemy of man. This is the wisdom monks have. They disarm their greatest weakness, sexual appetites. And sexual desire does not necessarily mean intercourse or even genital interaction. It may be nothing more than desiring affection from females. So there are many red pill males that pretend they can control themselves, yet reproduction hijacks intent without the foreknowledge of the operator. So a guy may think he can control his desires or maintain equitable male camaraderie in the presence of hot girls. And perhaps a select few can. But most will start the competition cycle, unconsciously viewing fellow males as obstacles, followed by peacocking and the inevitable disparagement of their XY competition. With primal drives in play, males will entertain the process of desire wherein they see something pleasing and begin longing for it. And suddenly, it's them against the world. And how can they get what they want before another knuckle-dragger steals it away? It's almost automatic. Take a group of guys, mix in females generously, and suddenly you have guys mean-mugging and jockeying for general positions in Her Majesty's army. <laughs> it really is pathetic. Guys, you are embarrassing. Deny or justify this truth. Yet, it remains. Male behavior and motivations do modify in subtle ways when around females, no matter their level of logic or command of gynocentric truths. Males that forego sexual desire, a.k.a. monks, they can withstand female influence because they purposefully, consciously practice sexual desire restraint. Gentlemen, you have to control your sexual and affection appetites. The world of male discardability that we have, which impugns your very life value. This environment of female exaltation, sold as female oppression. This is the world we get from reproductive drives and motivators. A world of violence at the behest of competition models. And competition models are driven by reproduction, which is beholden to the single law of life. Survival. I have said it before and will reiterate this truth again and again and again, which is sex ruins relations, period, point blank, sad, but true. Sex is corrosive to human relations, due in large part to the transience of attractions and the temporary nature of appetites, and the fact that chemical cocktails wane the more familiar you become with a certain partner. When you introduce the transience of sex or sexual affection into any relationship that purports eternal loyalties, thus you seal an expiration date on that sexual association. Some form of platonic interaction may survive, but sexual relations are extremely finite. Seriously, what's the difference between a familial bond and a romantic bond? Why does the association between a male and a sister, or a mother or a daughter, why do these associations stand for lifetimes, whereas girlfriends, wives, these come and go, despite all our cosmic soulmate starline divine union stories about romance? Hmm, what causes one interaction to endure, while the other dissolves with clockwork regularity around the world throughout history? because one type of association introduces sex, and sex ruins relations, pure and simple. Sex is not love. It is driven by chemical intoxicants to compel humans to engage for the ultimate goal of reproduction. And by necessity, sex is quick, intense, and fleeting. Like a hurricane, it is a whirlwind of chemicals, sensations which play with emotion, yet it does not last, and when it is gone, there is usually damage left in its wake. Moreover, many times the opposing partners of reproductive paradigms resent the other for this shallow fleeting association. Sex actually causes ill feelings between the sexes. Males hate the urges that control them and the realization that this is a mechanical act for females who do not truly care for males. And females resent the loss of their innocence to a male or perhaps the ruination of their body due to childbearing or just having to entertain smelly, hairy man -ape shovels grunting and thrusting inside them just to tease protection and provision from them. 
Furthermore, contemporary females are led to see all sex as sexual assault by males, which is more propagandized fodder to support female oppressive narratives. There are any number of ways either partner resents the opposite sex for the very act of sex. In reality, physical affection in which genital excitation lurks in the background, this is not love. It is males driven to spread their seed, and females desperate to receive it to sate their offspring dreams. Platonic relations stand because it is based on heart and genuine emotion, not chemical-driven frenzies we sell as emotion or love. Sex taints relations and dooms them to expeditious deteriorating finite shelf life. And it doesn't matter your persuasion, gay, straight, whatever. When you introduce sexuality into an association, you ruin it on some level, period. And the sexual attraction between homo sapien opposites. This is the Achilles heel males fail to recognize or exercise control over. I can't count how many times I have been having a conversation with another male, and as soon as some attractive girl walks in, he abruptly discontinues his part in the conversation, trying to catch her attention in order to solicit a conversation from her. This happened to me just today. I was having a conversation with another male, and we were having an in-depth, pleasant conversation. Then, as soon as some cute girl he knew came around the corner, he totally abandoned me mid-sentence to talk to her. This is how quickly males' higher functions are hijacked by reptilian drives. Guys are so thoroughly distracted, hormonally and chemically seized by temporary beauty, and this compels males, friends, family, etc., to sabotage and backstab each other, whereas such horror or treachery could not be fathomed by sober males in the absence of chicks. And it is precisely the sexual appetite that tempts such betrayals. So, again, sexual desire and failure to control sexual appetites, this is the downfall of men. It is not females. It is males' utter lack of strength and will to quell and control passions born of lower biological urges, not higher morals. It is males who follow their slave master, sexual desire. It is males who mess up friendships, not the nagging skirts they chase and support. It is a tragedy when males break up relations because they choose reproduction over genuine male camaraderie, as these courtship chemical zombies pursue romantic relations with females to sate the incessant inner reproductive pressures. Plus, they get intoxicating chemical rewards and a temporary band-aid on their gaping inner wounds left by gynocentrism brainwashing them into believing themselves as vile abusers worth less than the benevolent breasted angels they victimize. Females are responsible for their mistreatment and malevolence towards males, but male devaluation and discardability, this is ultimately the fault of of males who allow it by not exercising control of themselves and refusing the abuse of others. Male associations are wondrous, and when guys are bonding at the bar after brawls or in the trenches of war, their bond is stronger than any other, a genuine, true bond deeper than any temporary chemical mischief inspired by feminine presence. But Understand, when a female enters the picture, it is not the female causing problems. It is male's lack of control and self-worth that betrays his best intentions, after which males find themselves betraying and backstabbing other males, family, friends, etc. Monk is the way to go, until such time as you can withstand behavior alteration and maintain sovereignty and male camaraderie in the presence of chicks. Male devaluation is reality, in large part, because males fail to control reptilian reproductive drives. Yes, you may assert that money or power are greater stimuli for male treachery from one to another, yet the competition paradigm falls out of separateness theory, which is that you are separate from me and I am separate from the next guy. Thus, we have to compete for survival amidst a landscape of hostility and finite resource. It is really males fighting or succumbing to lower primitive reproductive drives. This is the problem, and this is the saboteur of male fondness and camaraderie. Treachery comes from reproduction, since reproduction is literally survival of the species, which prioritizes importance on group survival rather than individual member welfare. And guess who gets marginalized in the reproductive melee? Give you a hint. We are gynocentric. 
And so out of reproductive survival, we get competition paradigms. And competition is where we get all the treachery, ugliness, and violence in humanity. And this trickles down into individuals. Competition acts as a divide between brothers. It is no accident that the level-headed voices throughout history, those who have advanced the human species, are those who had control of their sexual desires and could see through to a higher purpose, whereas the rest of the world were engaged in reptilian drives and chemical hurricanes. Gentlemen, gynocentrism is, but males can refuse it and reestablish the only true bond that matters, the bond of brothers, sober, caring, and empowered. Sovereignty is amassed from sexual control, and this is accomplished through monkhood. Embrace the beauty of the monk. They wield true power because sex ruins relations, and reproduction compels the loss of male innocence. My friends, stand with me, live free.